Well, thank you everyone for coming today to the talk from Bruno Bier. Uh, and uh, thank you again for all our panelists that are here and make it like this this uh, uh, talk, I hope it's like, very exciting and we can learn a lot. Bruno's gonna present money and taxes implement optional dynamic mechanisms. Bruno, you have uh, one hour and then we are gonna have 15 minutes for Q&A. Our panelists as always can interrupt at any time for, with questions. Uh, you can take over, Bruno, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much everybody for coming. I, I really like um, the arrangement of your office, uh, Bruno. There seems to be some furniture, pieces of furniture there, which I would need in my office. <laughs> so so this is, I'm gonna present you some, some work we've done with uh, Hans, Jean-Charles, Elou and Stéphane. And here we go. So, so <clears throat> In a sense, the paper is about trying to understand what, from a theoretical perspective, how, how can uh, financial mar capital markets fulfill their, their mission, their function, which is to allocate capital among projects and also to allocate consumption across agents through time and across states. And so if the market was perfect and complete, then this is our de Bruyne and we get an optimal efficient allocation with optimal risk sharing and uh, investment in a good project. But, but I think that in practice, there is uh, asymmetric information, and at least in our model, there is asymmetric information. So that's what we study. Um, and so the, um, so the goal is to, is to study at the allocation of goods among projects and agents in a dynamic economy uh, under information asymmetry. And we're going to start with a, a mechanism design approach, and then we're going to ask ourselves, can we implement the mechanism, the, the optimal mechanism with, uh, with markets as an equilibrium of markets? So um, I'm, just so that, so that you understand where we stand, uh, I'm going to mention three literatures to which we're related, our work is related. The first literature to which our work is related is the um, uh, um, dynam I mean, financial contracting literature. Um, uh, maybe one of the earliest and, and deepest paper was a paper by uh, Bolton and Sharfstein, and then some very, very deep stuff also has been done by DiMarzo and Fishman. Um, and so in those, in those, in those models, the, the manager is better informed than, than the financiers, than the investors. And so the, the manager is the agent and, and, and the financier is the the outside providers of fund are the principal. And, and, and it is assumed that the, the manager has more information than the investors um, about what the uh, real amount of wealth created uh, during the period is. And so the, the manager could, could be tempted to underreport how much wealth has been created and, and steal the difference or can privately secretly consume the difference between what has been really uh, uh, produced and 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 what is reported, um, and so there is uh, this this dynamic contracting literature which has studied this problem. I think the maybe the seminal papers were the papers by DiMarzo and Fishman, and there was a few others coming after that. And so what's different between the, the the present paper and that literature is that in 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 the literature usually there's one principal and one agent, so it's it's a it's a bilateral relation. Uh, we're trying to think of a of an economy at large with with lots of agents and lots of projects um, and lots of little risks that that realize here and there and how and then we have a, a an aggregate resource you know and we try to allocate resources across agents in this general equilibrium setting so that's that's the sense in which we're um, going a little bit beyond the uh, the previous literature on dynamic financial contracting. <clears throat> and that's related to a, a very interesting literature, um, maybe started by Kehoe and Levine, uh, that studies um, equilibrium in, in dynamic equilibrium in, 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 in financial markets under imperfections. And so what we share with that literature is the, an attempt to study a general equilibrium problem with constraints, with incentive constraints. Um, 
it's the approach we're going to take is a bit different because they start with markets while we will start with a abstract mechanism design problem and then we will show how how the the mechanism can be implemented with markets and our to the extent that we're trying to do something on money is related to the uh, very interesting literature um maybe initiated by Kiyotaki and Wright um that studied uh, that tried to provide micro foundations for the existence of money which i find very interesting um, and in, in this paper, we try to do that a bit. And you will see we will have a slightly different approach from them. Um, you know, what, what they do is they, they study an economy in which there is money. And then they study, well, is, is money useful or not? Which is, of course, a very important question. And what use does it have? Which is, of course, a very important question. We take a slightly different stance. We, we start from, from an economy in which there is no money. There is, there is no price. There is no market. There is no money. Just you know, a mechanism. And then we, we study how money can be used to implement the mechanism. And the sense in which we do mechanism design is also different from the sense in which that literature is doing mechanism design. Most of the time in that literature, um, it's really static mechanism design. You know, everybody enters one period the same, then things happen, and then the mechanism uh, gives you consumption depending on what happened. And then after that, we go to the next period. And again, everybody is going to be uh, made the same. And so in that sense, there is no dynamics in the mechanism. And so differently, in, in our approach, there is a, a, a memory. You know, what you did in the past is still haunting you today and will determine what the mechanism will give to you. You will see. In the paper. And that's like the dynamic contracting literature. OK. So. Of course, you should feel free to uh, to ask questions whenever whenever you want to, uh, and you know it's of course very uh, useful for me to uh, and, and nice also for me to hear you say things. So feel free uh, whenever you want. Alors maintenant, okay. I'll say something, Bruno. Yes, please. Bonjour. Um, Bonjour. <laughs> I agree with you about most of the monetary papers are basically static mechanism design or repeated game but not dynamic. But there are some papers, like when you edited at RE Stud on banking, which has a dynamic incentive issue. Thank you very much, Randy. It's it's nice to hear you. It would have been even nicer to see you. I hadn't seen you were there. Thanks a lot for coming. That's very kind of you. Um, Here I okay. am. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to look, sorry, I should have I thought of that paper. Um, and I I'm going to look at that paper again. Uh, Thank I'll you send you some much. comments and, and references later about the chart. Thank you so much, Randy. Oh, no, nice. Now I see you. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is great. Thanks a lot. Um, okay. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to start with a two-period model, and then we're going we're gonna to go to a, an infinite horizon model. And so I, I'm, I'm very happy we have this two-period model because it, it it makes things a little bit more easy to understand. So, so in, in the two-period model, um, so you have agents, N agents, they have concave utility, and for simplicity, they have, they have zero discount rate. And each one of them can invest. Um, so there's only one good in, in this economy, let's say it's rice. So you can either consume it or um, invest it. Um, and if you invest it at time uh, at time zero, then at time one it's going to give you some 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 more good. So if you invest one unit at time zero, at time one you, you you're going to get one plus sigma or one minus sigma. So you, there's a risky return on this asset. And so we have n agents, and basically we look at the uh, the limit case in which um, each one of them is small and in the aggregate in the economy, there is no aggregate risk. All the uh, projects from the diff all the outputs from the different projects are independent from one another. So, so I have my 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 grain of rice at time zero. I can plant it at, at time one. I can either eat it or plant it. No, no. I say it again. At time zero, I can plant it or eat it. No, 
at time zero, I plant it. At time one, I get a crop. My crop, I can eat or, can, or, or plant again. And then at time two, I've got a second crop. Okay. So for simplicity, there is only a risk about time one, and there's no risk about time two. But of course, uh, this is just for simplification. And in the dynamic continuous time model, there will be risk at all the periods. Okay. So in this context, you see, uh, we are consuming at time one and at time two, and there is risk. So the two economic effects that are taking place in this model is how is smooth consumption between time one and time two, and how is smooth consumption across states? So um, in, in, in the simple two-period two, two model, we're, we're going to have a benevolent planner. And so the benevolent planner wants to make people happy and wants to maximize um, the aggregate, uh, let's say, utilitarian uh, surplus. So it's the sum across all agents of the utility of each agent from her consumption at time one and her consumption at time two. And so what are the constraints that the, that the planner is facing? Well, at time one, so remember, we planted the rice at time zero, and now at time one, we have the crop. The crop can be one plus sigma or one minus sigma, but all the crops are IID. So um, um, the, um, the, the amount of resources available at time one will be just how much has been planted. And so how much has been planted is one. And what are we going to do with it? We're going to consume C part of it, and we're going to plant again K part of it. So that's the constraint. One has to be equal to the integral across I's of CI plus KI. And at time two, well, we have planted K at time one. And so at time two, we have K. It's just a storage from time one to time two. And so if we put the two together, we have that one, which is the amount of results we had at the beginning, is this the life, the sum of all the consumptions uh, through time. So the, which we can call the aggregate lifetime of consumption. And in the continuous time model, you will see something very similar happening. Okay, so it, we, we tried to design the, the two-period model to be as simple as possible. So here, you know, we just have one unit to share across a continuum of agent and two periods. So what happens is each guy gets to consume one half at each period. And so we have perfect smoothing of, of consumption through time and perfect insurance across states. So that's the first best. Now we, look, we, we now turn to the case in which you have information asymmetry. So it's no longer the first best, it's gonna be the second best. So now the agents, they, they you know, I have a, a shock, it, it could be a plus sigma, you know, so I, my, my output at time one is actually per unit invested, it's one plus sigma. But I could lie, I could pretend I only had one minus sigma. And so I would report to the principal, I'm sorry, I only had one minus sigma. And then I would secretly consume the difference between the two, which is two sigma. So now the principal is, gonna, is, is, is giving me a, a, a mechanism it's an, or a menu if you want. So I, I, I want to report if I was successful or not. If I was successful, I have to give to the principal one plus sigma. If I was not, if I report I was not, I have to give one minus sigma. And then as a function of my report and what I deliver, the principal gives me a consumption at time one and a consumption at time two. And one way for the principal to give me consumption at time two is to give me some capital that I can plant at time one and I will consume the fruits at time two. So the incentive compatibility condition says that my gains, if I, when I have a good output, my gains, if I tell the truth, are larger than my gain if I lie. If I tell the truth, I have U of C1 plus. C1 plus is the consumption that the principal is giving me when I say I had a good output, plus U of C2 plus, which is the consumption I will get at time two after reporting a good output at time one. And this has to be larger than what I would get if I was lying. If I was lying, I would pretend I had a bad output. So then the principal would only give me C1 minus at time one and C2 minus at time two. But then 
I will be able to secretly consume what I diverted, which is two sigma. So that's the incentive compatibility condition. And then the, the optimal mechanism maximizes uh, ex the, the uh, expected uh, utilitarian welfare subject to the incentive constraints and the IC constraint. Bruno, uh, uh, yes. a quick, quick question on the previous slide. Yes. If I were to have uh, lied and said I had the low output, would I be able to invest the two sigma in uh, grain production so I could do a little bit of smoothing? Okay, thank you very much, Daryl. This is a very important question. I should have been clear on that. We assume that, we will assume throughout the talk that investment in capital is observable. So if I lie, I will not be able to save and invest my secret uh, um, return. Got it. And that's very important. Uh, thank you very much for mentioning this because this is giving, uh, this is helping the principal. Uh, because now if the guys lie, they have to consume everything today. It's less attractive than if they could store it or invest it. And again, also we will ha not have hidden savings. It's, it's important and interesting to study hidden savings, but we're not gonna do that. I mean, one thing is like, usually in this literature you have like, if you divert resources, you just keep a fraction, right? Like you have a lambda. So yes. here the kind of point that's interesting here is like, you get the, the risk aversion will basically define how much power the, the right? Like, uh, yes, that's a very good point, Bruno. We could have, uh, you know, instead of saying that we have uh, two sigma, we could say, we could multiply by, by a number between zero and one, and, and say this number is the efficiency of the stealing technology, but there will be no, absolutely no, no qualitative change in the results. And, and you know, one of the reasons is, is because of what and you and, and, and Daryl were saying. We don't need this uh, inefficiency of stealing to make, to make stealing not too attractive. All right, so what's, what's, so when you solve this problem, what happens is that in the, in the optimal mechanism, agents who report um, high output are given more capital to invest, to consume more at the second period. And so there will be some extent, to some extent there will be some insurance. So what happens at time one is that the guys who are truly unsuccessful those who have one minus sigma, they get a little bit from the successful ones, but they get less than they would in the first best. And why do they get less than they would in the first best? Because incentive compatibility condition limit the extent to which we can transfer from the successful ones to the unsuccessful ones. So here is a little graph. So um, you have, uh, these bars are the consumption of the agent. You have, a little one under the first bunch of bars, that's time one, a little two under the second bunch of bars at time two. And then the, the gray bar is the, uh, the first best consumption. Do you remember it's one half? So I consume one half at time one and one half at time two. And the blue and orange bars are the consumption in the second best. So the blue one is if I was not successful. So you see, if I was not successful, I get less than in the first best. And actually I even get even, even less uh, at time two. If I was successful, I get my orange bars, which are above the first best. So you see that compared to the first best, there is now more volatility in the consumption of the agents, which is to say that there is imperfect insurance. But if you were to consider autarky, which would be, you know, I, I invest, I consume my crop, that's it there. I have no interaction with the rest of the world. You see that the two lines for autarky after failure and after success are even more dispersed than what you get in the second best. So in the second best, you have some insurance, but not perfect. And so now, um, now, now comes money. So now, so, so far, what we had was mechanism, direct mechanism. So you observe something, 
you make a report to the principal, the principal will allocate consumption and investment across agents. No market, no price, no money, everything real. So what we would like to do now is to, to make this a bit more realistic and to see if this allocation could be, which is the second best allocation, whether it could be implemented as an equilibrium allocation of an economy with markets. And what is going to be the market in that economy? It's going to be the market in which we exchange the good for money. And the principal will not participate in the market. The principal will give people money at the beginning and they can use it to trade. But the principal will do something. The principal will um, raise taxes. The principal will tax the agent uh, and the taxes here will be contingent on capital. So what happens at time zero, the principal gives you money. At time one, so at time zero, the principal gives you money, you invest your grain of rice. At time one, you get a return on your grain of rice. And then you can trade some of, of your good against money, buy some more good or sell some good. You consume and you invest. And you have to pay taxes on how much you hold as capital. And then at time two, you consume the output from, from your capital. So related to uh, what Daryl was saying before, investing in the, in, the, in the asset is observable, and that's why it can be taxed by the government. And it's also the only way to save. No, it's, oh, I'm sorry, I said something wrong. In the continuous time model, there will be another way to save, which will be money, but not in the two-period model. Okay. But in the two-period model, so we have a finite horizon, very finite, and yet money has value. And money has value because you need money to pay your taxes. So what happens is uh, the agent wants to maximize uh, expected utility of consumption. At time, actually at time one, you, um, you know, the real decision you have to make is the decision at time one. So you have observed your, your return, you observe if you're successful or not. And now we, you have to decide what to do with, with your, the goods that you have. You can consume them, you can invest them, you can sell them, and you will, you will be taxed. So what's your budget constraint? Your budget constraint is that your resources must be larger than your expenses, and your resources are, in real terms, the return on your investment, on your time zero investment that pays off at time one, plus the real balances that you hold, which is the money that the principal gave you, divided by the price, we have the, the real, value of money. That has to be larger than what you do with it, which is you consume, you invest, and you get taxed. Okay. So what happens, so now, as you will see, we will, we will be able to implement the second best with a market equilibrium. And what's gonna happen in equilibrium is that if I was not successful, I will sell some of my money against good to those people who are more successful than me. And so I will get more, you know, I had a, a very poor crop, very bad return, but I get some more, some more goods from the others. So that enables me to uh, consume and invest. Now, why, why are the others the successful one? What are they, why are they willing to give me some consumption goods or investment goods in exchange for my money. It's because they've been successful and so they want to they want to consume and they also want to invest a lot to be able to consume a lot next period. But in order to invest a lot, they must be able to pay taxes. And to pay taxes, they need money. So that's why they're willing to give me some goods in exchange for money. And so what an agent does here is to solve this problem. The agent wants to maximize utility of consumption at time one, plus utility of consumption at time two, and then subject to the, the resource constraint. So lambda is the multiplier of, multiplier of the resource constraint. And now what, what we want now is that 
The first order condition of this problem will give rise to the same consumption and the same investment as in the second best. So you see that when the agent is taking the first order condition, there is a derivative with respect to taxes. And so the, ta the, the principle will set the tax schedule so that the first order conditions will be satisfied at the level of consumption that we have in the second best. And this is how the, the, the principle can design a tax schedule that implements the second best in the market. Sorry, uh, no. Yeah. Yes. Uh, taxes, taxes are applied in units of real consumption, yes? Yes. And uh, in solving the model, I guess there's no problem here in designing the tax schedule so that it could have been applied in nominal units. Is that correct? Yes, I think you're right. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you. Just another another clarification is that, Bruno, you, you're the constraint that the taxi must be paid with the money you have? Yes. So you have a cash in advance constraint on the... So it's, it's yeah, it's a bit like a cash in advance constraint. Yeah, you you to pay your taxes, you must have money. So it's similarly to the cash cash in advance models in which to buy goods you must have money. So th there's a similarity here. The difference, I think, is that uh, in a cash in advance model, it's it's a constraint that prevents that makes allocations less efficient. Well, here it's it's actually endogenous. You know, the the it's it's a feature of the way in which you can implement with markets, money, and taxes the optimal allocation that was determined by the direct mechanism approach. There's another difference, Bruno. This will help you. In yes, your, thank you. In your generic cash and advance model, if I want to trade with you, I have to use money, even if we have a double deviation or a bilateral deviation to use credit or barter or something else. So those models rule out, you know, potentially uh, profitable deviations. In your case, it's the government or the mechanism designer who's demanding cash. We don't have to hold him to the same standards you hold self-interested agents. Yes, that's that. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Randy. This is, this is really uh, uh, useful and also uh, thoughtful. In a sense, you know, we have we we have here, and we will have later markets which are incomplete. The, the only market that there will be, and that there is here in the two period model, and also that there will be in a continuous time model, is the only market is the market in which you can exchange the spot market in which you can exchange goods for money. So it's a very severely incomplete market. But but the fact that the market is incomplete is not an exogenous assumption. It's an endogenous result. We first solve for the direct mechanism in which the only constraint is the incentive compatibility condition. And then we show that in a, in a very incomplete market like that with appropriately designed monetary policy and taxes, you implement the second best. Bruno, uh, there is a question on the Q&A, uh, just a clarification question. Can money be used to buy capital or it's solely for consumption goods? Uh, okay, that's a very good question. Thanks a lot. I, our model is very, very, very simple. And so there is only one good. Consumption good and capital good is the same thing in, in this very simple model. So it's grains of rice, which I can either use or plant in the ground to get returns in the future. Thanks. Uh, Bruno, can yes. I come back to your, yeah. uh, your point yeah. about cash in advance versus taxes? A moment ago, you said, uh, I think, that as opposed to a cash in advance model here, by virtue of taxes, we can work toward uh, second best. Does Is it not the case, or tell me why I'm wrong, that if you were to apply cash in advance and uh, change from taxes to inflation, which is uh, dictated by a monetary authority, you would end up with a, you know, it wouldn't be an additive tax, it would be a multiplicative tax in effect. And you would be back in a world of second best if you had optimal monetary policy. 
Well, thank you very much, Daryl. It's I think what we do is very much in the line of what you said. In the continuous time model, we will have two instruments, taxes and inflation, uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy. And both in instruments will be necessary to implement the direct market, the, the, the second best. And I think it goes in the direction of what you said. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And it's it's hopefully, you know, I mean, I like the two-period model very much, but there are a few things in the continuous time model that bring a little bit more action. And that's one of them. Just uh, just one thing, just one more clarification is if you didn't have the taxes and the money holdings, right? You can still do something just with the nonlinear tax on capital, right? What, what more does the money element allow you to do? No, no, that's a very good. That's a very good uh, uh, um, question. I I do not think that the way in which we implement the uh, the second the direct mechanism is the only way. There could be other institutional arrangements that could implement uh, the uh, the second best. Now, if we only had, but to to, to focus on the one, precisely on the one that you mentioned, if we had no money, uh, just taxes, just a nonlinear tax taxation. There's something that the agent would not be able to, you, you, we would need subsidies. We would need the government to, to, yeah, to tax the rich and give to the poor. And that could play the same role as the market in, in, in our two-period model. So you have a restriction here on the shape of the tax or? No, in the two-period model, there is no restriction. Okay. So in, in the two-period model, you could do it without the money, you're saying? I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying I'm sure of that. I'm saying okay. that I think you're right to say that okay. it could be like that. All right. But I, I, I think you're right. <laughs> uh, Bruno? Uh, yes. So, uh, okay, in setting up this decentralized problem, uh, I don't remember seeing the incentive compatibility constraint. Uh, maybe I missed it. It was there, but if so, uh, if there is no incentive compatibility constraint in this problem, does it mean that this system, money taxation system, could be used to implement the first best as well? If not, what would go wrong if uh, we try to implement the first best? No, that's 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 a really excellent point, uh, Semi. Thank you very much. So, you're right. You know when we. When we characterize the solution of the of the mechanism design problem, we do a maximization subject to an incentive compatibility condition. When we implement with the market, there is no incentive compatibility condition. However, we know from the first part of the analysis what's the best that can happen in terms of allocation of consumption. So then what we want is we, we want to ask, is it possible if you let the market do its job to arrive at the same allocation of consumption? And the answer is yes, if we use nonlinear taxes and money in the way we have described there. If you want, when the, when the age in the, in the equilibrium, <laughs> I think it's a very good question you ask. I, I, I was very puzzled by this in the beginning myself. You know, why is there no incentive compatibility condition in the market equilibrium? In in you know the the agents have their in the market equilibrium the agents have their output. They don't have to report it to anyone. And something that really helps us a lot, and that's related to what the question by Daryl earlier on earlier on, capital is observable, investment is observable. So if I, you know, that, that, that's, what, what's, what, that's what is going to give a grip to the government to implement the allocation it wants to implement. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think, okay. Still, uh, well, what I don't see is uh, why can't we implement the first best by setting the marginal uh, tax rate according to the first best allocations? uh marginal so, utilities uh, yes the, the, we will not be able to do that because the we, 
it, it is not possible to find a tax, tax schedule such that we have optimization by the agent, market clearing in a market, and equal consumption by all agents in the, in the two states. It will not be possible to do that. I, I see. There does not exist such a solution to this decentralized yes. problem. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank but, you. But thank you very much. I mean, it's a very, very good point, and I, I need to clarify that. So I'll make a note of it. Thank you. All right. So now, so here is the insights from the two-period model, and we're going to go to the to the dynamic model. So we have a model with two economic effects. One is consumption smoothing through time, and the other is consumption smoothing across states. We have an incentive constraint that imply that insurance is imperfect, and that uh, agents must have more capital and more consumption after success than after failure. And we can implement the optimal mechanism with money and taxes. And here the agents um, can use money as a safe asset to smooth consumption. And that point is a point that was already made by the new monetarist literature. And, and we have that money is valuable in spite of, of a finite horizon because it is required to pay taxes. And also that point was already made you know, all the chartalism uh, uh, literature is, is, or the modern monetary theory, or Cochrane, which was one of the guys who do modern monetary theory, um, is arguing that. So, so now we're going to have uh, infinite horizon. Uh, and so there's going to be a technical problem arising. You know, we talked about, uh, and, and we had a discussion with Randy about, um, you know, what it means to have a dynamic mechanism. So, what it means to have a dynamic mechanism is that what you promised at time t depends on the whole history of what happened to you before time t. And so now the mechanism, the direct, the optimal mechanism is going to have to, to, to remember the whole, it's going to be a state variable, the whole distribution of all uh, the promises made to all the agents. And that, that's going to be an infinite dimensional object. It's very complicated. But in fact, and it's the genius of Jean-Charles, you know, I would never have been able to do that. Jean-Charles was able to find a, a model and solve a model in which, no, it's not, it's, it's okay. We, in the optimal mechanism, we don't need to remember everything like that. The state variable is not gonna be the whole distribution. The state variable is just gonna be the average. So that's gonna be endogenously, the average is gonna be the state variable. That's gonna help us a lot. And then um, if you look more at, at the economics of it, so what are the, the new thing that we learned from, from the continuous time model relative to the two period model? Well, one is related to what Daryl was saying. Um, we're gonna have both monetary policy, inflation and fiscal policy taxes. And there will be an interplay between the two. Um, and so the intuition of the role of monetary policy will be the following. You remembered, in, you've already seen that in the two-period model that we want people, incentive compatibility requires that what I get depends on my, my return, on my project. So we want people to be exposed to their project, to the risk of their project. We want there will be an optimal level of exposure of the agents to the risk of their project. That's gonna, the, the optimal mechanism is gonna characterize the optimal level of exposure to the risk of my project. Then when we do the implementation in the market, people will choose how much risky asset to hold and how much safe asset to hold. And the inflation will have an impact on this choice because you know the safe asset money is exposed to inflation. So if I raise inflation, People want to hold money less, and therefore they hold more risk. And so by setting the inflation, the government will have an influence on how much risk exposures the agents have. And that's how we will be able to get the same level of risk exposure in the market equilibrium as in the direct mechanism. 
So that's the intuition. Bruno, is there a way to use continuous time? As opposed, I think discrete time might be easier, but you seem to like continuous time. Uh, well, nothing is easy. No, nothing is easy for me. <laughs> I always struggle. Um, in this particular case, really, to be honest with you, the, the, the beautiful mathematics in the paper is, is, is Jean-Charles. Uh, and, and, and for him, it was easy to do the continuous time model. Not for me. <laughs> but you will see there is some, some sim beautiful simplicity, actually, in, in what Jean-Charles was able to do. Um, OK, let's go there. So we have this uh, continuous time model. So, uh, and this continuum of agents, and they have a, a, a discount rate row, and they have log utility, and they invest in a technology that's, uh, Y is the output of my technology, DY is the, you know, the, the flow of output from my technology, and you see it is linear in K, which is the amount of capital I put, so we have a linear return to scale, and it has a mean, mu, and it has an element of risk, sigma times dB, and B is a Brownian. All right, and so the aggregate capital in this economy is the sum of all the Ki, you know, Ki is the agent, and the integral over agents of the Ki, that's the aggregate capital. Now comes something that is not, the way I write it is not kosher at all. I'm taking a low large number uh, across a continuum of Brownian motions, and uh, no, 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 you can't do that. But in fact, uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, and I'm really, frankly, not very competent about that. But um, my co-authors, who are competent, are using mean field techniques to actually cope with that problem. And the upshot of that is, in the end, you get everything works as if there was a low large number. And so that's what we do. Now, OK, so what, what do you do in this economy? You have your capital. K, so K, that's the aggregate capital in the economy. And what is the flow of output during um, between T and T plus DT? Well, that's mu, which is the return, the profitability of, of, the, of the risky asset, the average profitability of the risky asset times K, which is the amount invested, total aggregate amount invested, so multiplied by DT to have the flow within one carrot. So that's how much wealth a, a production you met, you, GDP if you want, as production per period. And then from that production, you subtract your consumption, which is the integral over all the agents of the CI, which is the agent's consumption, minus CP, which is the consumption of the principal. So here, you know, we are really uh, approaching this in, a, in, in, in the tradition of, of contract theory, in which the principal is consuming and the agents are consuming. And so what's left after we have produced minus the consumption, what's left is how much we invest. So that is K dot, which is the rate of growth of capital. All right. So now, uh, it's a slightly complicated problem for me. So we're going to first do the symmetric information case. Bruno? Yes? Just a quick question on the previous slide. So, so K, K dot, that would be the aggregate capital, right, that K dot uh, evolution. Yes, let me go back so that we can see. Yes, so K dot, it's the, it's the growth of the aggregate capital. So is it implicitly assumed that the marginal units of capital are always allocated uniformly across all I's? Oh, that's a very good, very, very good question. Um, in, the, in, in, in the model with asymmetric information, we will not allocate uniformly across agents the capital. Some will get more and some will get less. So the, the, the K dot, you know, this is the integral of all these things. I see, but, it, but this equation doesn't fully describe the intertemporal location of capital. So you just talk about the aggregate. Absolutely, Vitor. You're perfectly right. You're perfectly right. Sorry, I was, I was not clear on this. K and K dot, that's the aggregate. Thank you very much. So, so first we look at the symmetric information case. So now you remember we have this law of large numbers. So the aggregate output is deterministic. The agents are risk averse. 
under symmetric information, we give people constant consumption. Everybody gets the same consumption. And so we could get give them the same capital also. And uh, so that's what an agent um, lifetime utility is. It's, it's the sum from zero to infinity of uh, exponential minus rho t, that's the discount factor, times log of CIT. CIT is my consumption of Mr. Rye at time t, and log is the log utility, it's utility of consumption. So if, if you look at how this varies over a small interval of time, a small instant, then it gives you that D of omega, you know, omega is my lifetime consumption. And then through time, as omega is gonna move, D of omega is gonna be equal to rho, which is my discount rate times omega, minus log of CI, which is my consumption. Everything multiplied by DT. So you see in the symmetric information case, we give full insurance to people that consumption is deterministic and the evolution of that consumption is determined. And their, the evolution of their utility is also determined. So now, this is the problem of the principle. So V is the value function of the principle. The principle is going to maximize the present value of her uh, expect or utility of consumption through time. I was going to say expected, but that's not useful because every, the aggregate is deterministic and the principle's consumption is deterministic. So at time t, the, the, the principle will get CPT, and V is the, is the present value of all that. So the principle will have to choose to, to get the highest possible satisfaction, the highest possible V, subject to the promise keeping condition that we just saw, which is basically telling us what must be given to the agents, and the capital constraint, which is telling us um, how we can use capital. So I'm sorry, I realized I, I skipped that. I thought it was in the interest of time, but it was not. So you remember when we had this discussion about K dot and K, integrating by part, we can say that K is equal to the present value of the future consumption, of the aggregate future consumption, discounted at the rate mu, which is the productivity of capital. And you remember when I was showing the two period case, I was telling you that capital is equal to lifetime aggregate utility of consumption. And here, uh, I'm sorry, like lifetime consumption, not utility of consumption, and here it's the same. So that's the second constraint that the principle has to uh, take into account when doing the maximization. So what's the solution? Oh, sorry, before we do that, we need to introduce um, a, a notation that is gonna be useful also for the uh, asymmetric information case. So we're gonna, we must define the equivalent permanent consumption. So you remember, I have my continuation utility, which is my omega i. So that's the unit, if you want, is the util here. Um, and then the equivalent permanent consumption, the unit is gonna be how many grains of rice. So one of a row, which is, you know, it's a way to discount the future. So that's the present value of a rent times the utility of the per equivalent permanent consumption is equal to the continuation utility. This is how we define the equivalent permanent consumption. And so that's equivalent to saying that the equivalent permanent consumption is the exponential of rho omega, omega being the continuation utility. And using that variable rather than omega will prove helpful uh, in many computations. All right. A quick so question, now, yeah. so, Yes. Uh, why? Why did you introduce a principle here? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Piero, you're asking this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, Piero, that's a very good question. Uh, so we did so because we, you know, we we approached this problem. We were coming from dynamic financial contracts. So basically, what we had in mind was a, if you want, a, a Sannikov problem uh, with a principal and an agent. And we were asking ourselves, oh, what happens if we have many agents instead of, of, of uh... so, and so that gives us a situation in which the principal is also eating. But uh, um, it's not very natural. For example, people who are doing macro, uh, they, 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 they like to have a, they often like to have a planner who's not consuming, who's just, allocating resources in the economy. 
So and that's what you had in the two period model. That's exactly what you had. Yeah, exactly, Piero. You're perfectly right. For, because we want it to be as simple as possible in the in the two period model. So, in what's going to happen is I am going to give you a Pareto frontier, which is going to give to be how much you know is going to be. We're going to define with incentive compatibility. We're going to define how much resources are incentive compatible in this economy. And then I'm going to give you a Pareto frontier, which will share those resources between the principal and the agent in the spirit of a, of a principal agent model. And there will be one point on this, on this curve in which the principal will get no, nothing, no consumption at all, and the agents will get all the consumption. Thank you. And so let's go there. So what's the result? And so I'm showing you the, uh, the optimum with symmetric information, because you will see that the optimum with asymmetric information will be very similar. So really, the symmetric information optimum is, is a stepping stone for us. So in the symmetric information optimal, optimal allocation, we're going to have a, a rate of investment equal to mu, which is the productivity of capital, minus rho, which is the discount rate. So that's the, the rate at which we grow our, our capital, our physical capital. And then we're going to have a, a principle whose consumption will be a constant fraction of capital. So CP is going to be equal to gamma P, which is a constant, times KT. Now we have um, <clears throat> mu minus rho, which is invested, and therefore rho that is consumed. So a fraction rho of capital is consumed every period. The principal is consuming gamma p. So what is left for the consumption of the agent is rho minus gamma p. So the aggregate consumption of the agent is going to be rho minus gamma p. Now, what are the agents going to consume? Each agent in the optimal mechanism, in the optimal allocation, is going to have a consumption CIT, which is going to be to be equal to a constant times the agent's equivalent permanent consumption. So the agent's equivalent per permanent consumption, remember, it's the exponential of rho times the continuation utility. And so my consumption, I missed a riot time t, my consumption is gamma A, gamma for agent, which is a constant, times my um, equivalent permanent consumption. Now, Bruno, all these things, 10 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so all these things, what they do is they say that the, the ratio of average across agents, equivalent permanent consumption divided by capital is constant. And I am going to rush so fast. So now we're going to look at the uh, asymmetric information problem. So now I am agent I. I privately observe my Brownian shock DBI. And like in the two-period model, I, I make a report to the principal about my private shock. And then the principal, as a function of my report, is giving me a current consumption, a certain amount of capital to invest, and correspondingly, a certain amount of future continuation utility. So in the symmetric information world, um, there was no need to uh, let the agents bear risk. There was per, the, the aggregate risk was, it was, there was no aggregate risk because all the risks were idiosyncratic. So the agents had deterministic consumption. And I rem you may remember, we said that the promise keeping was D of omega, the change in omega, is equal to the difference between rho omega and log of consumption. But now, with um, um, in incentive problems, we will no longer be able to provide the agent perfect insurance, just like in the two-period model. So to this deterministic term, when I want to characterize the change in omega, I need to add a term that is a function of the Brownian, of the realization of the Brownian. And so, at, for the moment, this equation is, is a, it's a consequence of the uh, Martingale, re Martingale representation theorem. And here, an important element is this yit, which is a function of the past, of everything we have seen in the past 
up to time t. Okay? And so this y i t, the economic interpretation of this guy is this is the sensitivity of the agent's continuation utility to the agent's performance. You did not have a, a script i on the Brownian motion. Oh, I should have, a, a, I forgot there should be an i on the Brownian motion just like in the previous page. Sorry for that. Thank you very much. That was a mistake of me. Um, so now, blah, 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 blah. okay, here is, <laughs> I'm rushing, so I, I didn't realize I would have so little time. So the incentive compatibility condition, you remember I have this Y, which is the sensitivity of my continuation utility to my performance. What the incentive compatibility condition says is that this Y has to be, my, the sensitivity of my reward to my performance has to be sufficiently large to provide me the right incentive. And what is sufficiently large? It has to be larger than the ratio of my capital to my consumption. So you see, the incentive compatibility condition is going to impose some constraint on what, how we can allocate capital and consumption. And to come back to the point by Victor before, we're not going to allocate capital to everybody the same. Those who have a large DBI will have more capital allocated to them. All right, so now this is the control problem of the principle, just the same as before, you know, just the same as in the symmetric information case with the same value function, the same state equation for the evolution of aggregate capital and a promise keeping condition that is modified because now we have the sigma y Brownian term and we also have a, a feasibility constraint that says that the sum of the Ks, so the, the Ki, if you want, the Ks we give to all the agents, has to be equal to the aggregate K, okay? Now what we do is we bind the incentive compatibility condition, and now this capital constraint can be written in terms of the Y, the C. So it says that the sum of the Ys and the C is equal to K. And you see, when I take those sums, I'm taking sums across agents, and each agent has a type, and the type of an agent is omega, which is the continuation utility of the agent. And so when I take my integral across agents, I need to take, I need to multiply the terms by, if you want, the density of this type, which is dP of omega. And that's why the P, the distribution of the omegas across agent, is going to be a state variable. Boom. And now <laughs> comes a horrible. Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. So let's first think about this equation. What would be the equation with only one, one agent? Well, it would be almost the same. We would have rho v, you know, v is the value function of the principle, is the sup, so log of CP, that's the consumption of the principle. Then, uh, um, uh, well, let's, let's neglect for the moment the second line. The second line is just the Lagrange multiplier multiplied by the capital constraint. So if we had only one agent, then the third line, you know, the, the one which is VK, so that's the derivative of the value function with respect to capital, it is multiplied by the drift of the capital accumulation problem process. And then the two last lines are the lines that correspond to the derivative of the value function with respect to the continuation utility of the agents. The, 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 the bottom line is the second derivative, and, and the line just, just above that is the first derivative. And so it's the, the traditional Ito's lemma uh, situation, you know, the one that is multiplied by the first order derivative is the drift of the, con of the promise keeping, of the evolution of the continuation utility. And the, and the last one, the last line is the, the second order term with the second order de derivative and, 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 and the variance of, of the evolution of the continuation utility. Now, so that, if it was that, it would be like very standard and maybe, uh, you know, Sannikov or the Mars of Fishman. But what is not standard here is that we have many agents. So now in all these uh, lines here, we need to have to look at what happens across agents. So now we are taking an integral across all the omegas. And when we take the derivative, we need to take into account the fact that we have this integral across a population 
And that's why we have a, a gato derivative, a gato gradient. Uh, but you don't need to think about that because you see in the end, all these complications, thanks to the magic and the genius of Jean-Charles, all these complications disappear. So how, how do we solve that? I'm not going to tell you <laughs> because I don't have the time. I'm so sorry. I think, how much do I have? Five minutes? Yes, five minutes? Okay. But -da, but -da, but -da, but -da. I'm going to, okay. So the optimal mechanism is strikingly simple. The state variable for the principle, this principle will have two state variables. One is going to be aggregate capital, and the other is going to be this ZT, which is the average across agents of the equivalent permanent consumptions of the agents. So instead of having to use a state variable, the whole infinite dimensional um, distribution is just the average. And so in the optimal mechanism, just like in the symmetric information case, we have that the principal is consuming a constant fraction of capital, and the capital grows at a constant rate, just like in the symmetric information model. But the rate of growth of capital is lower than in a symmetric information model. And that comes from the fact, intuitively, that comes from the fact that we have the incentive constraint. And you remember the incentive constraint was saying something about capital. It was constraining the, the, the ability to have capital. And so that incentive constraint is reducing growth. Uh, so we know just uh, one quick question. So here, the the y don't do, does not depend on omega, which means that the optimum is to have a a sensitivity that's uh, to performance that's constant, like in the cross section of the, of agents. Yes, yes. Th th thank you very much, uh, Pierre Olivier. I, I've been I've been rushing so fast that I neglected to say this very very important thing, a, a very important characteristic of uh, the optimal mechanism is going to be that the sensitivity of an agent's reward to the agent's performance, you know, which we call the Y, is, is going to be a constant. It's going to be the same across agent and the same for all states. So instead of being a complicated function of all the history of what happened to this agent, it's going to be a constant in the optimal. So the, the aggregation that Vitor had in mind earlier is kind of simple at the end also. Awesome. Exactly, yes. Thanks to that, exactly. Absolutely. Because, you know, the capital that each guy is going to have is going to be, because of the binding incentive constraint, is going to be Y uh, times the consumption. And so Y being a constant is going to be very helpful to aggregate the capital. Uh, Bruno? Uh, yes. Is, uh, does log utility play a role in this uh, constant y result or oh, yes. be more general you're, you're so smart Simi of course yes you're so right of course it's log is our friend you know is really helping us so much I have no idea what would happen outside log uh, and even in the in the in the symmetric information model log was also already very very nice and, and simplified things the fact that y is a constant and does not depend on anything um, I have a, a clue that log is helping here. Okay, thank you. Um, so the agents now, in, you know, unlike in the symmetric information case, their continuation utility is going to be stochastic, it's going to be a Brownian motion. And so you're going to have a lot of inequality in this economy. And we, we know, so this, this distribution of the omegas, we actually solve it in closed form that is given by this. All right, so now we have a, a maybe, so now we have a Pareto frontier. You know, we, 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 we discussed about that uh, with, uh, with Piero. Um, so um, we have an aggregate capital that is growing at rate G. And you remember, and we know, we know what G is, G is this. So we have an aggregate capital that grows at rate G. And we have a principal who consumes a fraction gamma p of this aggregate capital. And gamma p, we know what it is equal to. It is equal to rho minus one over something that depends on y. So what's the equivalent permanent consumption of the principal? You know, how happy he is. Well, that's this fraction 
of the total capital that he consumes, multiply by the exponential of the growth rate divided by the discount factor. The agents, for the agents, what is the equivalent permanent consumption? It has a similar structure. The agents, what they will consume is going to be one over i of y, one over y. That's the fraction of their equivalent permanent consumption that they will consume. And what and and so how how happy are, are they going to be with that? Well, their their consumption also on average is going to grow at rate g, like the eight, like the principal. But we have this term rho sigma square y square divided by two, which reflects the fact that you remember the agents have a Brownian motion in their continuation utility. So they have risk, they're exposed to risk. And this minus rho sigma square y square over two is a risk premium that reduces their utility relative to the situation in which they would be um, um, without, not, without exposure to risk. And so now we can continue to go to speak to the important question raised by Piero. The principle in our model is consuming and it's trying to extract rents from the agents. And how does it, the principle do that? By exposing the agents to risk. The more you expose the agents to the risk, the more you're going to be able to extract uh, rents from them. And so the fraction of capital consumed by the principal, this gamma P, is increasing in Y, and the fraction of capital consumed by the agent is decreasing in Y. And so now we have a Pareto frontier. So uh, if you look at the right-hand side, um, this is on top, the orange line is the Pareto frontier under symmetric information. And then the blue line below that's the Pareto frontier as a function of, of, of the agent in the asymmetric information case. And you can think of this as each point on this Pareto frontier corresponds to a different Y. So if, if you increase the Y, you reduce um, uh, the agent's um, 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 utility. So now I'm, I'm rushing, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I would like to tell you a little bit about money. How many minutes do I have? Bruno, how many minutes do I have? Please. I can't hear you. I think you are, you are done, but like we're supposed to have 15 minutes of uh, Q&A. Why don't you take another five and- Five minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna that. try to do less than five. I'm gonna, uh, okay, here we go. I, no, I, no, I can't do that. Oh my goodness. So okay, I'm just giving you that and then I conclude. So we're going to, just like in the two-period model, we're going to decentralize uh, the optimal mechanism with the market and inflation and taxes. So the market is a market in which agents exchange the good for money. Remember, there's only one good. The principal does not participate in the market. The only thing the principal does was, is to create money and tax people. Tax here are going to be a function of wealth and wealth is the sum of capital and the real value of money holdings. The principal will have a monetary policy, which will be how much money to supply to the economy, and that will determine an inflation rate high. Okay. And so now I'm skipping, skipping, skipping. And here we are. So we have a, a, something like a welfare theorem that says that any point on the Pareto frontier any instance of the optimal direct mechanism, well, for each point, there exists a policy, inflation pi, tax rate tau, which implements the direct mechanism in the sense that the allocations in equilibrium of that economy are going to be the same as the allocations of the direct mechanism, of the optimal mechanism. So, in a sense, that's a welfare theorem, but that's not like the usual welfare theorem because we don't have perfect markets and because we don't have lump sum taxes. You know, <clears throat> in the welfare theorem, in, in the first best, um, in the second best, um, uh, in, in traditional markets, um, in the second welfare theorem, I'm sorry, second welfare theorem in, in traditional markets, we want to have lump sum taxes in order to avoid distortions. Here, it's quite the opposite. The tax rate 
is designed, the tax rate and, and the inflation rate are designed to have an effect on the agent's decisions. So that the agent's decisions are gonna be corresponding, are gonna give allocations like the same as those we had in, um, in the direct mechanism. And last slide and I'm done. So in this model, we can we can have a money can be a bubble or not. We have depending on the parameter values, and then I go to your questions, guys. Thank you very much for <laughs> raising your hands. We have one situation in which uh, actually there will be monetary contraction, and the value of money is going to be the value of taxes, and that's going to be like in the two period model. And we're going to have another regime in which we're going to have monetary expansion, and money is going to be a bubble there. Um, and basically, the, the, what hap what's happening in that equilibrium, I like this equilibrium a lot, the principal is printing money, printing money, and selling it to the agents and getting goods. Some of it, he gets goods in exchange for it, and he consumes the goods. So the, the principal is living off seniorage in that uh, second regime. And so now I go to your questions. So Daryl, I think, was raising his hand first. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ter uh, terrific. Uh, uh, presentation. I'm going to have to spend hours on the manuscript, but I have a simple question. Yeah, the main friction in your paper arises from the fact that the principal cannot observe consumption. Yes. And so the principal observes wealth and applies a tax to wealth. Yes. In, in the United States, there's a giant debate about whether it's easier uh, to observe wealth and tax wealth, or it's easier to observe consumption and tax consumption. And the general spirit of many uh, suggests that uh, it's easier to tax consumption, observe consumption and tax consumption. So what is it about uh, uh, the observability of wealth uh, being easier in your model uh, that appeals? Yes. So thank you very much. That's a great question. Um, so I think at the bottom of this, this paper, the thing that is not easy to observe is what happens within the, 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 the firm the way in which resources are managed and allocated and consumed within the firm. So when I say consumption is not observable, it's really like the principal, the, the agent, sorry, the agent, the manager can use the firm to get consumption that is not declared as consumption, but that makes me happy. You know, like I, I'm, I'm hiring my, my brother-in-law uh, as a computer scientist in, in my firm, just because this way my wife is happy. And this is how I, I have secret consumption. My brother, you know, is, you know, is a pain to have. He's not very efficient. But, you know, so for the, for the firm, it's actually using the, uh, the profits of the firm. But I have a, a private consumption from that. I, I so get I'm, it. I get it. But now I understand that you apply this mechanism maybe at the firm level. And we shouldn't think about government and government taxes, but rather some sort of tokens that the firm is issuing and then taxing back to its employees. Well, so, so, uh, can I chip so, in? I know your point's a good one. It doesn't apply only to uh, consumption within the firm. It applies to uh, consumption within the family. If you yes. have home production, a uh, family is like a factory. And the same thing there, you get your wife to make dinner and then you do the dishes. These things are not observed. Yes. Not, not taxable. You're right. Absolutely. And so um, to, to continue on, um, on, on the discussion. Um, so, you know, I think in a sense, our model is consistent with the notion that wealth is not taxable. Because in a sense, what is not taxable in our money is the creation of wealth by individuals. Uh, and, 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 and capital, you know, that's, that's observable. Money holdings in the bank, that's observable. But this creation of wealth that can in, in part be diverted by the, by the, by the manager. So um, that's a little bit tricky because a lot of people would say money holdings, maybe it's observable if they're in the bank, but if it's under your mattress or in your pocket, that's not observable. Yeah, you're perfectly right. You're perfectly right. Here we we are only looking at uh, money in the bank, and in fact, we have a companion paper in which uh, we have a Bitcoin, and now we have in in that companion paper we study the competition between Bitcoin and money in the bank, uh, and and yeah, I and, know that paper. Yeah, thank you. And so that 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 is not it's a bit like money under the mattress. Right. Okay, I have another comment. Daryl, are you done now? Can I jump in again? Um 
you assume that taxation, I think, is enforceable by the tax authority, right? Yes. David Andelfato has related work on mechanism design where he says, you know, like you mentioned Kehoe Levine, agents could renege on their private obligations. Andelfato says they could also renege on their public obligations, that is the tax bill. So this puts a constraint on how much taxes you can you can raise. If the tax rate gets too high, say agents will opt out. And it's okay to assume taxes are observable, but I mean, uh, enforceable. It might be interesting to consider adding the constraint on, you know, the agents voluntarily want to pay their tax bill. Yeah, that's very interesting. What what was the author? I'm sorry, I didn't I'll get you, it. I'll send you, David Andelfano will send you an email. Oh, yes, 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 yes. He's a good guy, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah I would love to have the reference. And he's Canadian as well. Well, you know, once you're Canadian, you have to speak French. Hey, we. <laughs> Um, I I think I have fun Chip... I now and then Piero got it. Hey hey Bruno, um, I had a yeah, I had nice a to see you. Nice to see you. Um, so in your in your dynamic model, um, you you have kind of both inflation and taxes playing a role in getting you to the optimum. Is that in part because you're allowing for like this this CP this this the principal it, uh, is allowed to have consumption. So if if you were to restrict the consumption by the principal to zero, would it be enough to just have one of those two instruments? And in particular, could you implement everything using just taxes and no inflation? Well, that's a great question. So in the special, so we have a special point on the Pareto frontier in which the the, the you know the gamma p of the principal is zero. Uh, and so all the consumption goes to the agents. But even then, uh, uh, we, we need to have uh, both the taxes and, 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 the, and the money. And I think it's because the, there's a really, uh, if, you, if you want, a form of strategic interaction, strategic complementarity between money and taxes, which we can a little bit understand already in the two-period case. Um, in the two-period case, the reason why money is, is valued is because it is needed to pay taxes. Yeah. So, so I guess my question was that: Do you need do you need to be able to change monetary policy? So, like, you you could have money, and then just implement the the gamma p equals zero case with with just fiscal policy, or or the other way around. I guess. Yeah. That that. No, thank you very much. Yeah. 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 The answer is we need inflation. It, it, Inflation is not going to be zero in the optimal mechanism to implement the optimal mechanism. And that's related to the discussion we had before. By choosing inflation, the government has an impact on the relative attractiveness of money and risky assets. And so if you would like the agents to bear a lot of risk, what you do is you, you increase inflation to make holdings of money less attractive. Thank you, Smehat. I'm gonna, hold a sec, I'm gonna um, turn on the light in the room in which I am because it's getting really dark here. I'm back, I'm back from Transylvania. So, so um, um, Piero, maybe? Yeah, yeah, I had just a, a couple of uh, uh, questions, uh, try to be quick. So the first is that uh, what is the relation between the uh, efficient allocation, the incentive efficient allocation you characterize? If you consider a simple case of a risk neutral principle and a single agent, is that uh, is the outcome the same as the one you are getting, which of course would be a result in any case, but just to understand. So I wish I was able to I were able to answer your question. We've tried to solve that case, and um, it's it's actually not not straightforward. Uh, here, it, you know, what really helps is this log utility thing uh, that pins down pins down the consumption of the principal. You know, if, mm. if you want in the, in the you see in the sim, in, you can already see that in the symmetric information case. Um, in the symmetric information case with no aggregate risk, everything is simple. The consumption is always a, a 
a fraction of, of the capital stock, both for the principal and for the agents. So mm -hmm. that simplifies everything. So we, we should try to look at a, a risk neutral principle. That's a great idea, but. No, no, but also the risk neutral principle and single agent, right? So that's. Uh... Yeah, well, risk neutral principle and single agent, uh, that uh, um, is not very different from Sanikov. No, no, exactly. But at the end, I was wondering whether your solution is the same at the end in terms of individual path of consumption through the aggregation and the use, the way you can use the law of large number, whether at the end the path of consumption is the same as you would have with a single agent. So if the principle is risk neutral, do we have the if same If the thing principle is risk neutral, exactly. So I... Not with not with information asymmetry, huh? With information asymmetry, we still need incentive compatibility constraints. No, no, of course, with information asymmetry, right? So that's uh... with information asymmetry, the economy is not as if there was a single agent, huh? because the agent. No, no, you have a principal and an agent yeah. with private information. Or oh, just the one principal. agent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's an ECOF. A risk neutral principle and just one agent. Yeah. That's an ECOF. Right. And so the solution you get, how different is that from that? The path of consumption of the of the agent you get, right? At the end, they were all behaving in a very similar way, right? So I was just wondering how much the heterogeneity, the fact that you have many agents that are, though they are exactly identical, how much that affect the so I, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I need to, to, to anyway, work more okay. on that. The, 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 no, but thank you very much. That's, I should know the answer to that. One, one, I was telling you it's like Sanikov. In fact, it's not like Sanikov because there's one difference, which is that um, it's, it's a big difference between our paper and, and, lo and a lot of the finance, dynamic financial contracting literature. In, in the current paper we have, um, um, you capital is an important aspect of the game. You, you change the, you decide at each point in time how much to consume and how much to invest and how much capital to allocate to the different agents. And so capital is used as a way to incentivize agents. Uh, and so that's different from uh, the model in Sanikov or our own models uh, or the Dimazo. Yeah, Dimazo Fishman, uh, they have some investment, but then they have cost, transaction cost at the time at which you change the, the level of your capital. So, so that, that makes things complicated. What we have is there's no cost of changing investment, the size of operation of the firm. There is no um, adjustment cost of, of investing. So you can invest and change the, your capital as, as much as you want in continuous time. And, and because of that, we are using capital a lot as part of the incentive mechanism. Now, <laughs> Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because of that, it's not the same as Sanikov. So I was wrong to say that with a risk neutral principle and, and a single risk averse agent, it's like Sanikov because of this capital dimension. That hmm. being said, I have still not answered your question. <laughs> I realized no, that, no, that no. I'm sorry, and I, I, will, I will- Okay, just very quickly. Now the second was just a very brief uh, point in terms of connection because the literature on dynamic public finance is touching a very similar point, which is using taxation to implement efficient uh, allocation under private information. Now, have you thought of the relation between the with, with that? You're absolutely right. There is a there is a very uh, very close relation. Um, you know, with Jean Charles, we have another paper that that really does uh, public finance. It does uh, you know uh, taxation in Malaysian taxation, if you want. Um, uh, but in a two-period model. Um, so I think you know, one, one important difference in terms of assumptions is our assumption that um, it is capital, or not capital, capital productivity, how much wealth is created by the firm that is not observed by the government. The, the public finance literature dating back to Merlis is assuming that what is not observed is the skill of the agents in the labor market and the individual workers' uh, uh, productivity. You know, that's a Merlis. I was more thinking of dynamic public finance and Coachella Cota and others, right? Which is 
these guys are, if I'm not wrong, making the same type of assumption, which is they, they are considering a situation in which you have workers whose uh, uh, productivity is not directly observed by the government, by the, by the principal. And so the asymmetric information is about that, is about the, the and so the capital is not entering the stage. You know, in, in our model, the capital multiplies the Brownian motion, if you want. In, 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 in these uh, new public finance models, there is no capital that, that multiplies the, uh, what would be the equivalent of the Brownian motion. Anyway, yeah, I should stop. Okay. And, and I, I, I would like to say an additional then... thing. I would like to say an additional thing on that, which is that um, I, I, I'm, I'm really uh, very impressed and I, I really like very much the uh, these public, dynamic public finance models. Um, they, in general, they don't give you a solution of the, of the problem. In, they do numerical simulations and things. It turns out that the problem we study uh, has a almost closed form solution. <laughs> which is, you know, some people like that. <laughs> so we have Sammy and then Vito uh, with questions. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a quick question. Uh, so right now uh, to implement this second best, uh, we need both monetary and fiscal policy Yes. Uh, with this money and, uh, and taxation scheme. I was wondering if it is possible to implement it only with fiscal policy we don't have money in the model. It's a real model, but uh, the principal can introduce a risk-free asset. So there is risk-free asset and taxation and no money. Would it be possible to obtain the same uh, result? So it's a very good question. Uh, risk-free asset is almost the same thing as money. Uh, and the only... The only difference here is 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 money has in there is inflation, so it's like a risk free asset with inflation, um, and 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 we show that it, inflation is an important uh, um, instrument that the government wants to use. So if if risk if we interpret risk free asset as money without inflation, then that's not enough. Uh... Wouldn't be the just uh, growing the fiscal deficits and stuff be equivalent to inflation in the model with risky asset, uh, risk free asset? You know, I yeah, may, maybe not. Yeah, this. No, no, I think that's a very model. interesting and very very good question. I I am not claiming that our implementation of the direct mechanism is is unique. You know, in general, as we know, you know, when you implement a direct mechanism, there are several implementations. So it is possible that an, another implementation going along the lines of what you suggest would do the trick. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Bruno, uh, so it seems that the, <clears throat> the underlying uh, information of friction here is often IID nature. Yes. So uh, what this means, right, if you, uh, <clears throat> what this does here is, you know, even regardless of how I allocate capital across different eyes, the average return rate is going to be always mu. But yes. of course, if, you know, there's some persistence here, people that have better, uh, better projects that tend to have better returns in the future, this is going to add another kind of like a benefit of, of this uh, unequal, unequal allocation of capital, right? So if someone has performed well, actually I can change the average return by allocating capital towards agents that have higher, uh, you know, have announced or revealed to have higher returns in the past. I know this would make everything very messy technically, but I'm wondering if you can compare at least maybe to the other extreme, like if there are some permanent shocks to, no, to return. Some agents just have higher returns always, a lower return is always. Yeah, so, so that's that's a really good question. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, first I'm going to give you a very simplistic answer. The, the, the closest version of our model that will go along the lines of what you suggest would be to have a model in which the, the different agents would have different mu's. So it would be mu i instead of mu. Okay, but these mu's would be observable and, and set, you know, constant. 
So you're mm -hmm. just more productive than me. Your mu i is larger than mine. Right. The principal knows that, and etc. Et, et. So um, we, we have not solved that model, but I have some intuitions about what would happen in such a model. Um, it it would create a, a it will raise the scope for additional inefficiency because your mu is larger than mine. So you're a good guy and I have a low mu, I'm a bad guy. But maybe I was lucky. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I, when I rolled the dice, I, I got a better output than you. Now the incentive compatibility condition will imply that I will get more capital and you will get relatively less than in the first best. Uh, and so that will be an inefficiency. We're, we're gonna reward luck. And, and sometimes this will go against uh, uh, allocating to the best guys. I guess what I'm thinking is the reverse, is that this would, there would potentially be an additional efficiency of doing this relocation if getting, you know, if getting a high output today is indicative of you having higher output in the future. It would yes. maybe be counterbalancing this, uh, this effect, this loss somehow. Yes, yes, Victor, you're right. That, that would be a very interesting model. That would be a model in which the muse would not be observable. And possibly maybe you would observe the, the whys or something like that did maybe. And, and, and so that would be a little bit more like, uh, you know, we had a discussion of the new dynamic public finance literature. That would be a bit more in, 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 in their um, uh, line of, 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 of research. And I, I'm a f I have the feeling these models are more complicated to solve than the one we have. I guess so, yeah. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you again for all the panelists that joined. Thank you, Bruno, for the, the great talk. I will officially end the, the, the seminar here uh, and stop recording, but uh, actually I have some questions. We can start uh, 